Hi, lovely listeners. It's your RCP team here wishing you a happy holidays and happy new year. And you all know if you're on Facebook with me that I'm obsessed with hitting 20,000 Facebook followers. And I hope you can all help us out by referring a friend to not only our podcast, but to come on over to Facebook and follow us and like our Facebook page so we can connect and engage and have all these great conversations that we do every single week. And also jump onto Instagram. We're building our profile and we put lots of content on there and Twitter as well so you can catch us on most of social media platforms yeah and we want everybody to have a safe and enjoyable holiday season be careful out there be aware of your surroundings make sure that the people that you love are protected because unfortunately this world can be kind of cruel so we want everybody to have a safe and happy holiday This episode series was done in partnership with and sponsored by Showtime. Hi, I'm Catherine Lee Scott. Nice to meet you, Joyce. Everybody calls me Tilly. Tilly it is. Joyce is my mother's name. When you call me Joyce, I feel like you're talking to my mother. Is your mom still with us? Oh, good. I love knowing my mom's just a phone call away. I already talked to the cops. Four times in seven days, I understand. Yeah, so what is this? Let's not get into any details until the stenographer gets here. I mean, even though it's all taped, it's actually more accurate. This girl especially, she's been with me 15 years. I did a comparison. And I was right. Will you with the state police? Please. No, I'm the inspector general for the state of New York. Oh, so the post office? No, the post office is federal. I'm state. So if there's any corruption in the state agency, it's my job to find it and stop it. Hello, lovely listeners, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. I'm Laura Richards, criminal behavioural analyst, New Scotland Yard, and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And with me today in the studio is... Lisa Zambetti. I am the casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds, and I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. And today we have an incredibly special guest. In the studio with us today is... Well... She turned down her opportunity to be a supermodel to become an actress, writer, director. <laughs> Bonnie Hunt, that's me. <laughs> that's Welcome, right. Bonnie. Welcome, Bonnie. It's so, I'm so glad to have you here. It's such a thrill on so many different levels. Jim wishes he could be here today, too, but he was called into an emergency writers meeting at Criminal Minds. Um, but I know he would be thrilled to meet you. And uh, we're here to talk about a very special project that you're a part of. Do you want to tell everybody what it is? Well, it's a true crime story based on a true crime story, and it's done for Showtime Escape at Dunamora, which is the actual location where this prison was. It was built in the 1800s, and two criminals escaped in 2015. Um, And it's just an unbelievably compelling story of human nature and the fact that you can use your brilliance to do something. And unfortunately, these two guys used it for to lead onto a path of just really d- total sadness and tragedy. Right. And I mean, you saying that you can use your brilliance, you know, in different ways. And, and actually, this is a tale of, you know, the way that they broke out of the prison is really quite incredible. And your character um, is and obviously in real life, um, Catherine Leahy Scott. Mm-hmm. And she plays kind of tribute to them in a way and certainly tries to find out more how they did it by flattering um, sweat so that he tells her a little bit more about how he managed to navigate through those tunnels. And I've got to say, I found that absolutely amazing how he managed to do that. He's yeah, a really bright guy that you feel some heartache about when you see how his life unfolded. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Catherine Lee Scott, you know, when meeting her, she just, she's another brilliant mind and she has such uh, poise and Respect. I mean, she respects these people, even though um, she doesn't condone the behavior. Uh, absolutely doesn't. But she d- never talks down to them. And she just told me that this is how she approaches it. And she never lets them see 
her cards and yeah. she doesn't it doesn't have an opinion as far as they're concerned so that's a hard thing to play because it's really playing nothing but she did say with sweat that he was so charming that you really had to have your guard up mm. but that was the only time that she might have felt that you know her fight her face might have shown that she felt badly that this is the choices that he had made so that's the only time in this series that I had any I think where I showed a little bit of compassion as a character because um, you know I wanted to keep it subtle because I want to respect the fact that she is just a, a, a great professional at what she does I mean it's just so ethical yeah, yeah. so ethical but there was so much integrity and humility I felt that you know watching you portray mm. her and we interviewed her but I just felt her sense of professionalism and just that integrity and the way she tr treated them all, you know, with dignity. There, like you said, there was no talking down at any point with Tilly, I mean, with each of the characters mm. that you see. And I thought you did a brilliant job of, of portraying her. And her, she was, uh, you know, some people described it as a ruthless pursuit of the truth. I mean, I wouldn't call it ruthless. I'd say she was incredibly thorough in her work. How much time did you did you manage to spend with her? I spent a whole day with her and um, it was, uh, I, I can't remember how long I was there because it was a long drive. I drove up from the prison location to her office. To me it was, I just wanted to respect her integrity and her, and her professional approach, which was so minimal. You know, as an actress mm. sometimes you want more. And I said to her, do you ever get down and dirty? Do you ever mirror the the person that you're interviewing to try to make them comfortable and she said no I do not I treat them all as equals and that's how I approach it and she doesn't show her cards so that was you know just such a subtle thing to play but I played it with great respect to her that was my goal yeah you know I really it really struck me when I was watching your performance because when you hear the title Inspector General it sounds like a brass band should be playing wherever she walks through or mm -hmm. she should be a real badass. oh did they take out the brass band? oh <laughs> <laughs> wow Spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, and we had spoken to Catherine before we watched um, your episodes. And so I was really wondering, you know, what your process would be to play her. And you came across as so almost therapeutic in your approach to these scenes, uh, very gentle. And it seemed very thrown away. You didn't come after them, you know, balls out. Um, and, and I'm just wondering what your what was your process in those scenes? It was respect for how sad the situation was, mm -hmm. respect that these were people that you're speaking to, no matter what decisions they've made in their life, and that Catherine was so subtle, mm -hmm. and that's what makes her so lethally effective, okay. I mean, when it comes to getting information. She just approaches it in a very calm way that you're kind of drawn into it. That's what I found mm -hmm. about her character that I wanted to capture as much as I could. I and again, agree. I mean, there's empathy there as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very fine line that you're not drawn into someone's sort of drama and, and into them, and particularly when there's narcissism, mm -hmm. um, and to keep her boundary and her perimeters, but also get, get what she needs out of them. And I think she did that in terms of all those interviews and how you characterized it as well. You know, Tilly was talking and had done four statements, mm -hmm. but how she managed to get her to open up, I think spoke volumes about her interpersonal skills. And again, with Sweat, you know, just going into the hospital when he's in bed. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know whether that truly happened, whether he reached out his hand to shake her hand. But I, th I thought that was a very interesting scene, but just how she approached that whole interview. <sighs> I've been in the tunnels. Yeah? Yeah, that's my main focus right now. How did you pull this off? How did you plan it? The ventilation system you came up with is very impressive. Yeah. Well, I had to hotwire the fan, which was actually pretty challenging because I had already jerry-rigged another ladder I'd found on the same circuit. Can you tell me how you found your way to the pipe? Good sense of direction, good memory. Takes time, though. A couple weeks. Two brick walls. If you believe you're gonna get out, those are just obstacles. 
you know, and the, the why I say flattery is that, you know, she did give a nod to how impressive it was that he managed to, to get out. And actually, that was exactly the right tactic for someone like him to, to flatter him, to get him to open up. And that's why is I that felt, something you guys are taught? I mean, you guys, I'm saying that as a blue collar kid, but in your profession, they're they're taught to. That's right. I mean, to build rapport. Right. Um, it doesn't matter who you're talking with. You want to build rapport. So sometimes you will see things like mirroring. But mm -hmm. as you said, she didn't do any of that. It was more through subtle devices. And actually, part of her, I think, just being very authentic. I mean, I've not met her in person, but just even when we interviewed her, she seemed to come across as a very authentic person. She is. I mean, she's worked her way to where she is. She's climbed the ladder properly and with integrity. And you can see the respect around her when you're in her office. She's a decent, hardworking, intelligent person, and she is subtle, but mm. so effective. Even when she told me a story about interviewing Tilly, and I don't, I don't know if it was in the script, if it eventually made it in the script, I don't remember, but she said to me there was one point she was talking to her, and she said, how many canteens did they tell you to bring? Two. How many backpacks? Two. How many of this? Two. And how many of you were going to Mexico? And... Tilly just stared at her. Wow. It just, she just let it, you know, sink in because right. she was still convinced, even when being interviewed, that these guys loved her and were going to take her on this, into this beautiful life. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Now that I think about it, I've believed that a few times. <laughs> mm. Yes, and what people try and uh, persuade you of and the questions that you ask. And, you know, she seems to be somebody who's very good at asking questions and the right questions and mm -hmm. knowing when to let things hang for, you know, le letting you the fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you mm -hmm. fill in the blank and actually you take them on a journey. And I felt even with with Tilly, she did that. Um, I don't know if you ever read her 154 page report. I did. did. You go through? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Incredibly did. thorough. We did too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That oh, it was so well done. I mean, it was a page turner. Anything, I, I love these true crime situations, not certainly uh, with respect to the victims, but the thing that fascinates me, I shouldn't use the word love, I should say I'm fascinated that how easy it is to take a different fork in the road when you put, I mean, these guys, all criminals, male or female, put so much effort and work and thought into what they're doing, and you just think, if there was just this turn and they put that towards something well-intentioned in their lives, yes, that it would be just such a different outcome. It's almost like you want to take all these stories and show them in high schools just so every kid can say, just have a, a true life story of the decisions we make and how in an instant it can change the path of your life. The real life consequences mm -hmm. of things, and you know, I think Escape at Danamora shows kind of prison life in a in a very true and gritty way. Just going into that prison with that door, you know, every time a door opens, the one behind you closes, and yeah. it's just the sound and the smell and the the coldness. It's. Did you shoot on location, or did they build that where where we see you going through the metal detector and all that? That was. I think that was it. We were at the prison sometimes and sometimes on a set. I can't, I don't remember which days yeah, were sure. which because it was just frightening. Yeah. Because you think there's people in here and they're living here. And then the people that work there are basically in some type of prison as well. I mean, they're going there every single day. Um, you're going to be, a, you know, you're going to be taken in, I'm sure, by some people. And that's the whole thing about compliance. I, um, I think Catherine Leahy Scott talked about the rotation and not keeping people in the same departments too long because relationships develop. It's human nature. And I guess that wasn't really happening at the prison. Yes. I mean, it seemed to be, you know, they called it a culture of complacency mm -hmm. where even the small checks weren't being done. You know, and I think you see that right from the start at Danamora where, um, you know, Tilly comes in with Lyle and they don't go through the metal detectors mm -hmm. again to the side and you see these little lapses and then of course you realize how big uh, the lapses are of not seeing skin at night and checking that the prisoner mm -hmm. is in bed or right. you know, checking the integrity of the cells um, and things became very lapsadaisical and of course over time that complacency is, becomes a major problem. Right, and years of working there 
and not having an incident as major as this, I, I mean, I guess it, it just happens. It doesn't make it right, but it, it does, it did happen. Right. And I mean, there were some, what I would call missed opportunities before that. Oh, I mean, my. the report showed over 400, but even the ones where there was a rumor about her having a relationship mm -hmm. with, with sweat and that, you know, not being investigated to the standard that it should be. Um, so there were lots of missed opportunities for them to understand what was really going on if they really wanted to ask the right questions. And I guess that was for Catherine and her team to go in and why the report was so extensive. Yeah, and that's the great thing about the report is that anybody could read that report and understand and be able to follow the story, which you don't think is possible when some when a bureaucrat or somebody in the government right. writes something. It's so dry and so clinical and so boring. And, and as Brett Johnson and Michael Tolkien said, when once they got that report, it was just this beautiful flower <laughs> that they just, right. you know, could could work from and most I think accurate of crime very, stories. Yeah, that was super impressive. Um, and a woman with a husband and a son and a life, just willing to risk everything because she's of the excitement. Right. Sure. Right. I and mean, I think you do get that sense of Tilly, don't you, of her life and, and just what the prison being such a microcosm, you know, it's its own little world. And they're generations deep in mm -hmm, that town. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just three, four generations deep of people working for the prison. Right. This episode is brought to you by Showtime and the new limited event series, Escape at Danamora. Directed by Ben Stiller and starring Benicio de Toro, Patricia Arquette and Paul Dano. Based on bizarre but true events, Escape at Danamora tells the story of two prisoners who broke out of a maximum security prison in upstate New York and their twisted relationship with the female prison employee who aided in their escape. Thrilling, emotional, dark and unbelievable, in the town of Danamora, it's not just the prisoners who are looking for a way out. Watch Escape at Danamora, now streaming, only on Showtime. To try a free month of Showtime, go to showtime.com and enter code RCP30. That's RCP30 at showtime.com. This offer is for first time subscribers only and expires on the 7th of December. So my Brooklyn sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. In fact, have you ever heard of the term cool side of the pillow? Well, on these pillowcases, I always have a cool side of the pillow. And I got the smoke stripe color in both my sheets and a gorgeous duvet cover, which has brightened up my entire bedroom. And I'm going to post some pics on Facebook so you can see for yourself. And Brooklinen has a great selection of other colors and materials to choose from. Brooklinen sheets have been named the winner of the best online bedding category by Good Housekeeping, and they're getting rave reviews from Business Insider. So here it is. Brooklinen.com is giving an exclusive offer for just our RCP listeners. You can get $20 off and free shipping when you use promo code REALCRIME at Brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so sure you'll love your new sheets that they offer a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guarantee and lifetime warranty on all of their sheets and comforters, and that it's really incredible. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use promo code REALCRIME at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code REALCRIME. Brooke Linen. They're really the best sheets ever. So you're a 51-year-old woman who's been with the same man for 20 years, 21 years? So we can have an adult conversation. Okay. Did you have sex with these two inmates? No. Wouldn't it be convenient to be the only person who lives to tell the story? I think it's great that uh, yours is really the first face that we see um, in the series, and you're and you're driving in your car, and you're and you're just observing in this very, like you say, a very quiet way, just a very kind of inquisitive way uh, as you're being driven in, and then you meet Tilly, and these two these two women could not be more different, you know, and yet they they have to come into this room and connect, and I just thought it was just a stunning way to start the series. Um, and, and not the, seeing the front of Tilly, I thought that was very mm -hmm. interesting, seeing okay. you and knowing that you are, you know, uh, the main character in there and feeling the, the power and the gravitas, but in a very understated way. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the back of Tilly you know, as the camera moves around, I thought it was very effective. Oh, and Patricia Arquette is fearless. 
I mean, she just so yeah. good. And yeah. you're working with great actors. You're just so fortunate because it just becomes that great game of tennis. Right. She inhabits, I mean, to me, I say she inhabited every part of Tilly. I mean, for me, she's unrecognizable. Right. Just so incredible to mm -hmm. see that on, on camera and just see your scenes are very powerful. It, it was just so understated, though, seeing two women, you know, one trying to open the other one up and the other trying to sort of claim victimhood as, as much as possible. And then you start to see the dynamic play out. How did that feel, you know, for you going into that? that particular scene. Well, Patricia and I had so much trust in each other. We're fans of each other's work. We we respect each other. It was just so, uh, you know, it's like great music. You get up on stage and somebody's going to jam with you mm -hmm. as a jazz quartet. You just, you go for it. And she is just so talented and, and it was just easy. It was just easy because it was sincere. Mm -hmm. You know, she, we both respected our characters yeah. and, and wanted to bring them to life. And Ben had a clear vision of what he was doing, and you trust that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's fascinating to see that. And Ben, having such a strong comedic background, you know, I trusted it so much because I know comedy, you have to be so sincerely authentic to people to get them to laugh really hard, the kind of comedy that I really love. So I think that translates into drama. Absolutely. Very sincerely and uh, in a strong way and I knew Ben understood that about me and I understood that about him so there was no issue of oh you're funny and you maybe you can't do this if you're truly funny in the way that I think comedy is at its best when it's so authentic uh, coming from sincere emotion uh, it's it translates easily into drama in the scenes that you have, you have a scene with Patricia Arquette of, as we've said and David Morris who plays Gene Palmer who is a correct Love corrections Dave. My love I, of my I did life. the Green oh, Mile with oh him, and I thought he was going to hear my heart beating through oh. my microphone, my body mic. I was so <laughs> totally infatuated. And were you, you have a great scene with him, or he has a great scene with you. Um, was there any room for, to improvise at all, or was that pretty much on the page? Because you have a back and forth that is very, it's almost comical the way you call him out on his extreme, what do you call Compliance. it? Compliance. But also <laughs> his, um, his Male, male chauvinism. You call him out on his right. chauvinism. Mm -hmm. um, so was it on the page or were you able to? Mo that? Most everything was on the page. Mm -hmm. I mean, that day I had 103 or 104 fever. Wow. I was so sick. I was sick through. <laughs> yeah, I got the flu twice <laughs> oh my while goodness. we were filming. Yeah. So like every day I was like, <laughs> I mean, it, I think after that scene, David just got up and was like, are you okay? Oh, you yeah. would never know. Yeah, oh, you never amazing. know. amazing. Well, he, he was also got sick, but, but it's. David, and that scene there, you know, improvisation isn't only words. It's the way you look at each other. Mm -hmm. it, that comes from you as an actor. And David is just so good. Okay, well, I want to ask you about a circumstance surrounding. There was a delivery of meat made to Matt. Do you recall? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and how did that happen? She told me there was meat in the shop freezer for Matt. Who is she? Joyce Mitchell. Joyce Mitchell. And you're sure it was Joyce who approached you first and not Matt? Yes. Okay, continue. Well, I took it out of the freezer and gave it to Matt. Did she say why she was giving Matt meat? No. Did you ask her why she was giving Matt meat? No. Did that seem unusual? I knew we were in a gray area with the meat. Okay, but she never explained why she was giving Matt a huge chunk of meat. No. And you did not ask? No. I told her that she shouldn't be doing this. What, what she was doing was wrong. She needed something, she should go through me, because that wasn't the protocol for a woman to be doing that. So it's okay if you were doing it, but Joyce not so much? Yes. Mm. And why is it okay if you're doing it? Everybody, Paul, Dano, Benicio, mm -hmm. Trish, everybody's so good. Yeah that you just, you know, people ameliorate. You're with these great people and you all come to the same level. It yeah, lifts you, you up, mm -hmm. doesn't it? You mm -hmm. vibrate off of each mm -hmm. other and you can certainly see that in, in the cast. I mean, a tremendous cast, like you say. And presumably, so you'd worked with David Morse before. Did you mm -hmm. work with Ben Stiller before? No, Ben and I have known each other a million years, but we, this is the first time we've worked together. And was it a project that he wanted to bring you into? Was it him sort of saying, I really want Bonnie Hunt? Or 
How did that come about? Yes, I, I actually ran into the casting director at the World Series. It's Rachel Tenner, who yes. is amazing. Rachel, game seven. <laughs> <laughs> we were the only two people getting the last two cars left. We had to rent cars because there was no flights. I mean, I went there at the last minute. Uh -huh. So we were renting cars, to, and we were in the parking lot at the <laughs> rental car agency, said hello. And then she went back and was you know, already working with Ben and said, oh, I ran into Bonnie. And Ben's like, oh, Bonnie, yeah. could do this. And um, so he called me and we talked on the phone and I was in. Those are these synchronicity things that happen where you you just happen to see somebody. It happens to me all the time. See an actor right. and then a script comes. And it's like, oh, you know, it's like the universe is saying this person must, you know, be involved in this. Top of so. the mind, yes. yes. This yeah, is yeah, the yeah. ideal person. Absolutely. Yeah, it was nice for me. I had taken a few years off because I had someone in my family that was sick. So I went mm. home to be full-time caregiver. I was in Chicago. Mm. So I kind of came back into the business really after dropping out for a little while. So this was a nice a nice project to get. Right. And I bet your phone has not stopped ringing. I, I know. I'm sure if I do a pilot, I will be calling you. <laughs> I hope so. I completely trust you. And how about Benicio de Toro? You worked with him before? Pulled down him? Made out with him several times. Never worked with him. Is that for real? No. <laughs> and by the way, real. no, Please. it's not real. It to be real. He does have a lot of sex appeal. I want to just really say for the does. record, there's some... Thing online that says I had a relationship with David Letterman that never <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, David, you know your friends. You, yes, you but did. not that kind. Not right. an intimate or sexual or anything of that nature. I, somebody brought it up to me again yesterday. Really? Yes, at a lunch. I was like, no, uh, no. Wow. That's hilarious. Oh, You're no. setting the record straight. Right, it's and I'm now changing the rumor to me and Benicio. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a far better rumor. <laughs> oh, Benicio del Toro. So much oh, more pleasing. God. Oh, yeah, so wonderful. Do you get it? I, I totally yeah. get it with him. I we didn't have any scenes together, but we were together, you know, I saw him a few times throughout the process of filming, and, yeah, he's interesting, compelling, unique. Yeah. yeah. He plays that role perfectly. Yeah. Because he's really the ringmaster in all of this, isn't oh, he? Oh, and the fact that, well, I don't. you don't want to give everything away, but I mean, people, but for Sweat to... Be so loyal. Yeah, that, that's, that's it's something. It's so interesting because he has all the characteristics of such a decent human being. Right. Yet, oh, it turns that they're, that, that's why you got to watch it because yeah. it's just the human behavior aspect. Yes. Well, I think we're going to get into that when we get into those uh, episodes. But mm -hmm. yeah, what kept them together when he clearly could have left him behind and, and he, he could have, have made, he could have crossed that border days yeah. earlier. And, and Catherine Leahy Scott brought that up to him, mm -hmm. you know, why? And that was a great scene where she says 18 miles mm -hmm. in 18 right. days, and then in one day you do 18 miles, you would have made it. Mm -hmm. You know, that moment where the pen oh, drops. Was, that was hard to even say to him, even as a character. Yeah. <laughs> but she, you know, it's just, she's so good at what she does. Because she wants she... to get underneath it, doesn't mm -hmm. she? I mean, that that's why I enjoy her and, and you playing her so much, because she's so... In, in terms of her questioning, she's so smart. The questions that she asks, she's trying to get underneath to really understand the motivation and the character and the person and what went on. Yes, and she leaves those emotions out. You can't really read them. It was very interesting to try to get there for me. Mm. What was your preparation process like? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Just How did you immerse into her? I, out of respect for her. It was just out of respect. I'm representing her, and she is subtle and effective and as an actor you always want some kind of a caricature type thing to hook on right to. some kind of handle yeah but uh, your responsibility especially when you're playing a real person is to make sure that authenticity that is there in that respect so for me it was just like i i just kept her in my head that she doesn't talk down to the people she doesn't show her cards she's very subtle she tries not to have any emotion up front uh Except with Sweat, who she said was so charming that right. you know, she did have a moment. So I let, that's the only time I think, I don't know if it's there or not, but I played that I felt something mm. while I was talking to him. Well, charm can always disarm, and that's one of the things, wow. you know, around training. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time training law enforcement and, and others in the room. And so they, that's that's a great thing to remember. Yeah, power, the power and control will... Um, there is actually a, a wheel that Duluth, Minnesota put together and all sorts of tactics and tools that people can use to try and control another. 
Um, and charm doesn't feature on there, which is why I always say to all of my classrooms, you know, if I compliment you or if I say certain things to you and I show charisma and charm, what does that do? And it takes them a while to get it, that it increases likability. So it increases the rapport and you're more likely to take someone with you and then want to mm -hmm. like you because normally people's sub favorite subject is me, myself and I talking right. about themselves. Um, so trying to get them to explore charm and how it disarms people, which is why I thought that scene was interesting because he puts his hand out to shake her hand, even though he's very unwell. But even that moment, I wonder how many people have done that, you know, in her real life situation, sh shook her hand and yes. treated her with respect mm -hmm. and dignity in that way. It probably would have unseated her a little bit. And then just how his whole interaction, I know she interviewed him many times, mm -hmm. but how he interacts with her is very deliberate and intentional. Yes, yes, absolutely. And there was respect between them. And he knew that she was, you know, couldn't believe what he had pulled off. Yes. And I mean, even that, having that respect is always a, it's an interesting dynamic when that's in the room and how you're going to open somebody up um, so, so that you get authentic things rather than somebody just being deceptive and manipulative and, you know, telling you maybe what you want to hear. Okay, ladies, this one's for the sisterhood. Some fun facts and a new product. 62% of women think it's very important to use skincare tailored to their unique needs. But drugstore acne care is one size fits all. Curology is personalized acne care, customized to you and your skin's unique needs and mixed by an expert just for you. Without scheduling an appointment, paying a copay or even leaving your home, you can connect with an online dermatology provider who would design a custom prescription acne formula to be sent right to your door. Go to Curology.com, answer some questions about your skin, snap a few quick selfies, and then Curology's expert dermatology providers create a skincare solution just for you. It even comes to you with your name on the bottle. There's no gimmick, no complicated routine, and 88% of Curology users see results. Go to Curology.com slash real crime to get your first month free plus a free gift. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and handling. That's Curology.com slash real crime for your first month free plus a free gift. Curology.com slash real crime. The extent of complacency and failure to adhere to the most basic security standards uncovered by my investigation was egregious and inexcusable. New York State Inspector General Catherine Leahy Scott released her report on the unprecedented prison break. In her report, Scott points out several flaws at the prison that contributed to the break, including negligent or non-existent night counts, flawed celled searches and weekly inspections, inadequate employee screenings, and poor security oversight. You know, I don't know how much you read as well, because obviously you saw it all unfold originally in 2015. Mm -hmm. How much do you sort of read to try and immerse into a part? Well, I read her report and met with her. And then, of course, there was the script and, and Ben's direction. Uh, so, and it's hard because the more I get into it, the more I wanted to just I wanted to write a whole s script about her. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I love this character. I love her. I want to more of her so and do I bring yeah, her more to life because completely. there is so many levels to her and to Catherine I shouldn't say her it's, uh, to Catherine Leahy Scott she is has quite a story and quite a climb to where she is and has the respect and the integrity that you don't that you really can't place a bet on anymore. It's very, it's it's not, there is a lot of goodness out there in the world, that's for sure. And there's a lot of wonderful people. I see it every day in medicine uh, uh, with, uh, you know, patients and their families and the love, integrity, and, and care that goes into helping someone. But you, we should be able to see it in every industry. And uh, Catherine does that even in a job where she's really revealing people for doing things wrong for, on every level. Yes. I mean, she told me there was one story where there, just like stories where they would see a trend happening in a certain area and they would go in and find out there was a whole scam going on and just the the attention to, to detail and the tenacity it takes to do what she does and to go in and just pull the mask off somebody. Yes, and she's, she is an unsung hero, and I would love to mm -hmm. see it through her lens. Mm -hmm. Me too. I mean, yeah. believe me, that's my goal. I want. I told her that when I met with her. I said, this to me is a whole Absolutely. character I would love to play. And yeah, in a life. movie just on its own, mm -hmm. just a single lens of how she 
uh, you know, managed to infiltrate. Because I would imagine being a woman oh, well, going yeah. into a maximum yeah. security prison, she's trying to ascertain what went on, probably against many people who don't want her to find out. Mm -hmm. People want her to fail, and they will set her up to fail, of how she navigates her, you know, and comports herself through those situations. Yeah, and something yeah, she told get it. Though. I really yeah, do get it. Because so. Having worked at New Scotland Yard, <laughs> I understand there are many layers, you know, mm -hmm. that that we present when we walk into rooms and the job that we do. Well, I always say, as a woman, I've always had to say, I didn't realize it until I was looking back, but I would have to say things three or four times, um, and then I got to a point at my career where I would bring in a male partner and say, "You say this, that, and this." when we get in there yeah and they say it once and they and <laughs> that's it right and it worked Absolutely. and i would and i would go oh my gosh is this really true because i just didn't come into it that no, way was, you, you know. don't think about your gender and i would agree i never with did you. i never did no all across my career at new mm -hmm. scotland yard now i get it oh hang on right yeah right. that's because of what i physically represent that's mm -hmm. not because of my capability or competence or credibility well even when i was writing uh, my first television show that I wrote and produced and started, and I was the first person to ever do that. I didn't know that. I said, well, what about Mary Tyler Moore and Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett and Linda Bloodworth Thomason and Roseanne Barr and Fran Drescher? They all had their husbands right, running the show. Wow. I was a girl by myself. So I just kept, I didn't understand. And then when I went, I went to all the unions and I went to the network, I wrote an entire season and brought it in in a box and, and you printed out Amazing. scripts. Here's everything. So I was just trying to prove I can do it. And finally, you know, I was able to make it happen. But I just didn't know that every single woman in the history of television who had her own show had her husband or a brother or a family member who was running the show that was a man. To help them. That's incredible. Yeah, well, congratulations yeah. to you because it like oh, smashing through, you know, not I just did. glass ceilings, it's walls and floors at times. And I look back and I thank all the people that let me do it, but it, I think about it now when I see all these people with their own shows, these young women, I go, oh, wow, you know, I was yeah. the first. That's you right. paved, you the, paved way. the way and they stand mm. on your shoulders. And I it's not easy. Believe you know, that. pioneering things is not easy. You have nope. the, the bruises and the bumps and, you know, to prove. <laughs> your journey of where you've come from and you, you never forget and I would imagine she is that trailblazer too in her own mm -hmm. industry and again oh you know, Catherine it's... yes absolutely I mean that there's just you either get it or you don't and the minute I was talking to her I was like oh I was just so impressed by her yes I completely agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the, the greatest things she said is like, my job is not done yet, right? Mm -hmm. She's not just putting this in her rear view mirror and oh, 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 spit spot, you know, it's all done. I, I solved everything. No, I mean, she just has a real hunger to make sure this never happens again. Well, look at the new, the, uh, but the backpacks they all have. Have you seen those? No. So she lifted it up, showed it to me in the office. It's all the backpacks that go into the prison are all transparent. I oh, really. They're made out of clear plastic and yeah. black stitching great and I mean, you everybody knows everything you, the purse everything's tra is you, you can see through it and she seems steadfast in those recommendations you know even now i mean she was telling us that there'd been another situation where a female civilian who had also yeah. worked in the tailor and, shop in the same tailor shop did the exact same thing yeah did you know about this no yes after? <laughs> like, a, like yes, not afterwards. long after you know i'm not going to be on match.com i'm going to go get a job there <laughs> <laughs> no, so but they're going through that process again. This <gasps> woman had given Patricia Arquette the tour of of the uh, yeah right, yes. and it's she knew full well the whole story. Blah blah blah, and she still got involved with one of the pri one of the prisoners. We there. have a second season. Yes. Of the oh, I, I think there will be a second <laughs> season, um, and it's one of those things. I mean, as I said to her, the personality testing actually that really does need to go, uh, you know, in, into place that when they're recruiting civilians into an environment like that, it's really important to do personality testing because if you've got, you know, men or women who are people pleasers or addictive mm -hmm. personality or certain traits that are going to be you know malleable or maybe they're going in there for a certain reason too then you need to weed those people out otherwise it will continue to happen because relationships are relationships right. at the end of the day and people will look to exploit and manipulate mm -hmm. when you've got a sort of a, a power um, you know, relationship base, which is really what that is. And of course, the prison guards go through all the correctional uh, guards go through all different forms of training. So they they go through that training, but all the other people, civilians don't. Although she said, Catherine said that, that they're going to start to to put some training together. But that part is you so think that important. that would be step one? You I would. mean, your first day or before you even start that mm -hmm. you go through that. That's insane. 
Yeah, because people can exploit. But I mean, my question the, the whole way throughout, and we've been discussing it on Real Crime Profile, is who really is manipulating who? You know, when you do have that power and, and that trust dynamic, you know, there, there, it's almost like a Rubik's cube that tur- you can keep turning it, and you see different uh, perspectives on a situation. And, and that's why I think, you know, Escape at Dunamore and certainly the way it's been shot is so interesting, hearing the conversations, the dialogue, because, you know, initially you can think, well, you know, she's a victim, she's been exploited. And then you see, actually, no, she's actually been very proactive yep. in willing this participant and understood yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. things at different times about what the, the, the consequences were. And then you understand a bit more about her backstory. And then you, you know, is Gene Palmer, is he more running the show or actually is it Mm -hmm. much more about um matt but the perspective of when you hear and you see something and actually you know multiple people give a very different perspective on that one event that's almost what this show is about Mm -hmm. in in many senses isn't it and Catherine gives a very clear perspective i think in her report but also how it's portrayed within the the actual show itself and i think showtime really respected ben and so you know, that's it's nice that Showtime wanted to do this because the story's been told in the press. There's been little movies made of it here right, and there, right. which have all been done well and everything. But this this uh, take on it and representing all the different points of view, I think, is, is really good storytelling. Well, well, I wanted to mention that Bonnie is very, very picky about the projects you do. I mean, and I can tell you working on the casting side that anytime I've done a pilot, anytime I've done a movie, her name is at the top of the list of people that they want in it. And she just does not just do anything. And so maybe could you, could you speak a little bit about why this project, why, why this character? I think I'm selective because, I, I mean, I've been very fortunate and to be part of great stories. But um, I do care what I put out there. And this is a story with consequence. And that was important to me. The consequence is devastating. So the behavior... Um, you know, their feelings are understandable, the behavior is unacceptable, but there's a consequence. And so I think this story to me was on a human level so powerful. And Ben Stiller is a friend and, you know, just uh, trusting him as well. And I, the caliber of people involved in the real, the, the true story itself. I mean, I was drawn to it when it came out on the news. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, I was wondering if you knew about it before. Yes, me. because mm-hmm. like I said, I'm fascinated with someone making that decision because there's something so tragic, especially when you see David Sweat, this young man who is so smart. It just, it's heartbreaking that he is now in prison for the rest of his life. And it's horrible. Uh, and, and the consequences of everything that he's done, you know, the domino effect, anything, any bad decision, especially intentional, um, the effect it has on other lives is devastating, and we all need to remember that, mm-hmm. especially now. It's important. And having started my career as a cancer nurse, um, you know, I worked a few years in a trauma center and then went on into oncology, and I've never fully left my nursing. Uh, I work as a patient advocate now. and That's amazing. Um, I think because I saw how powerful what we do is when you're in the hospital room and you see somebody look at the television and I would bring in movies for people to watch and you could see them in a moment, forget all their pain or fear. Uh, Storytelling is really powerful and I want to be a part of good storytelling because I I know people need it. Mm, Yeah, and she has been, for those of you who may not know, Miss Hunt was in Rain Man, Jumanji, Jerry Maguire. She's been the voice of Sally in Cars. Um, Bonnie also had her <laughs> own television show called Life with Bonnie. And she also had the Bonnie Hunt talk show where she worked with a little producer named Little Polly Francis Sullivan. And um, you, I just want to tell you how much it meant to him to work for you. And Bonnie did a very generous thing. She let Paul do his stand-up. He was, wasn't was generous. It was uh, <laughs> a, somebody talented that wanted to be on the show. Well, for him, it was just a huge, very, for our whole family, it was a huge emotional deal. And, um, and Well, yeah. I love you and your family and Thank the kids. You. And, I mean, Paul is just one of those great guys that I was lucky enough to have on my team. I mean, we it was a team. Mm-hmm. We were just all equally together putting in 150%. Yeah. Great experience. Yeah. 
Well, you're multi-talented yeah. and that, that's fantastic. You write as well as, you know, appear in really heavyweight shows, which is what I would call this, which I know our, our listeners are going to love. Do you ever feel, you know, once you've finished, even at Escape at Danamora, do you feel kind of sad that something's completed or do you walk away and you feel pleased and happy with where you've got to and excited for it to then land? In my experience in this business, I know how temporary everything is. But it doesn't make it any easier when something's over because I love the people, you know, you become friends with everybody, especially the crew. Right. You know, these crew people are, it's freezing cold. We're <sighs> in New York City and they're never in a trailer. They're, they don't have any place to hide or sit down. Um, I'm always in, in, in awe of them. And they all remind me of my dad, who was a blue collar guy who worked outside a lot in the winters in Chicago. He was an electrician and a handyman extraordinaire. And... Uh, I just, I love being around those people. They give me so much energy and so much love. I, I just love, I love the process. It's such teamwork to pull something right. like this off. It it's really is. so much teamwork. And Ben was a good leader and uh, Showtime gave him the reins. It was an, a really nice experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Incredible. very true. It's a whole team that makes shows happen and you know some say it's like a family when when you're shooting things and particularly when there's a lot of extreme kind of emotions involved as well um, but it sounds like you like to keep things very real Bonnie and you know I, I 100 percent respect that and oh thanks thanks and thanks for having me on it's been Absolutely. a pleasure I've really enjoyed it do you since I knew you you did say that you're a health advocate and and you still work in oncology is there mm -hmm. a charity or anything you'd like to tell us about or any place that we could get involved? oh I work with so many um, the multiple myeloma research foundation I've been with for a few decades and I work with the American veterans. I work with Casa Kalina. They oh. have a rehab center with a plaque with my name on it oh, um, where we take amazing. care of a lot of traumatic brain injury patients. We had some people there from the Vegas shooting that we've helped a rehab that are walking now, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't know if they were going to be able to. Right. I work with the Arthritis Foundation, um, Juvenile Diabetes, they and also like my brother has manugiving.org, which is he's helping build a trauma center in Uganda, and he's out there often. He's a doctor, and he's a, a great guy. Worked his way up from the old neighborhood, put himself through medical school working at a gas station. So. Oh, wow. Incredible, yeah. and I know that would really chime with Jim as well as a, as a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today I got some fantastic news that my 27-year-old right. cousin Sophie, who had grade 4 terminal cancer, has just seen the doctor, and I should say brain cancer, um, and they've said that the tumor hasn't grown, and actually she's no longer terminal. Right. So Now, you just telling that story gives so much hope to anybody who might be listening that's just been diagnosed. And you have to hang on to that because medicine is accelerating at such a fast rate. Now we're saving, we're really saving people. Cancer is becoming like diabetes. It might be chronic, but you don't have to die from it. You can die with it. I mean, this is like a huge thing for her. That she, really didn't, you, didn't you say she has a little baby? She does. She's got a 17-month-old baby called Marcy. And she recently got married because they thought that, you know, she wouldn't be around too much longer. She was given an 18 month window to live. So this has really rocked our family. And today mm -hmm. I really am beaming because now Sophie has a future with her little girl and, and her husband. And she has an incredible positive mental outlook that where the family have, you know, found it very difficult. She's always been so full of hope that she was going to beat it. But she did everything possible to ensure that she you know didn't just survive that she thrives patients are amazing the patient's trying to protect the family from sadness the family's trying to protect patient from sadness you know there's all this protection going on all this incredible human strength and it's really important to embrace the fact that some people facing their own mortality they're not mere mortals anymore mm -hmm. she knows the yes. secret of to celebrate each day and to try to embrace good and bad and do the and best you can. Gratitude and, for everything. Yeah. Right. I and mean, she was writing these little notes for her daughter Marcy so that, you know, first day at school and just things that, that broke our heart. Um, and today I was just messaging her just before we start, started recording and just saying, you know, I'm so happy for you and, you know, completely bowled away because we just didn't know whether that would be possible mm -hmm. but if anyone was going to beat it the positive mental attitude that she has to, towards life and wanting to live you know she's only 
part way through her life. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy. And it's just been a pleasure interviewing you today. Yeah. As well. Thank you. You know, Jim Woodley wishes he could be here. And I we wish miss you, could, Jim. We miss you, Jim. But um, this was really great. And every, we hope everybody tunes in to watch Escape at Denimora on Showtime. Excellent. Thanks. So thank you so much, Bonnie. And for now, this is Real Crime Profile signing off. If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800-2000-247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800 799 7233.